The first anti-seizure drug was potassium bromide. Uh, Sir Charles Lowcock discovered this. Uh, it was the first drug that was actually of any use, really, um, in, in, in uh, combating seizures. The second was phenobarbital, discovered by, uh, serendipitously, really, by Halfman in 1912. It's better than the bromides, and it's still widely used, and it's very cheap and used in third world countries a lot. It's sedative, which is one of the big problems with it. But 50 other barbiturates were marketed in the first 35 years of the 20th century. These were the benzodiazepines of the 20th century before diazepam finally hit the market. This is a structure. I'm not going to spend any time on structures. Just notice the six-membered ring. It's a cyclic uridide ring, and it'll be important in a minute. The third anti-seizure drug, other than the barbiturate derivatives that I just discussed, would be phenytoin, or by trade name, would be dilantin, or its old term, diphenylhydantoin, if you go really go back in the literature. It was discovered by Putnam and Merrick in 1937, um, and it was discovered by an experimental means. They actually put a cat in and shocked the cat um, using drugs that were obtained from Park Davis and sent to Harvard for this study, um, and phenytoin actually stopped the seizures. So this was a huge advance, this discovery of any time. It established an effective AED. And again, I'll be talking about AEDs, but they're really anti-seizure drugs. They need not be sedative because phenytoin, in fact, doesn't present with sedation. Uh, you can go to the laboratory and find new drugs. Um, it shows that we could find selective anti-seizure action. I'll get back to that in a minute. And structure activity relationships and basic investigations. It was really a huge milestone. Uh, this discovery of phenytoin. And this led us to the early concept of discovery of anti-seizure drugs, which used experimental methods for determining activity, both of which are still used today to some extent, especially maximal electroshock. Um, so if we look at these two uh, paradigms, MES over here, um, uh, and, and subcutaneous penling tetrazole, okay, we discover that ethosuximide is not effective in MES, and subcutaneous pendolene tetrazole um, it, it doesn't work, uh, phenytoin doesn't work against subcutaneous pendolene tetrazole. So we have this interesting paradigm, and this uh, correlates with anti absence drugs, and this correlates with anti-focal seizure drugs. Now, the, the correlation is quite imperfect, of course. Uh, for example, phenobarbital is a rotten drug, uh, uh, for uh, for absence seizures, uh, but it works in, in penylene tetrazole. But in any case, this was a major way for us to try to find uh, the possibility of finding finding new drugs. Um, there are disadvantages. These are old tests. The mechanisms aren't that obvious. Uh, but the challenge of newer tests is validation. How do you prove, in fact, that a new drug is validated like these old tests, uh, MES and PTZ? They were validated. If we look at anti-seizure model validation, and this is my own view, it's a, it, 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 not everybody would necessarily agree with this, but my definition of anti-seizure model validation is the model has independently discovered a new therapy for humans, okay? So only three anti-seizure models are validated, in my opinion. MES for phenytoin, penylene tetrazole for trimethodione, and later on ethosuximide would be found by the same method. Uh, which is still widely used today, trimethodione being too toxic is way back in the background. And finally, more recently, Kindling well, with Wolfgang Lerscher, where levoteracetam sort of broke the mold. It, it's effective against partial seizures, but it really doesn't work very well in maximal electroshock. So that, those are the, the three validated models. Now, from 1938 to 1960, we developed 13 anti-seizure drugs, okay? Dione, succinamide, barbiturates, et cetera, and, and, and several other high uh, uh different from phenytoin. But the problem was we were developing on this all on the same basic structure. This is a cyclic uridide structure, and you can see that um, even up to ethosuximide, which was marketed in the U.S. in 1960, um, that we're using the same basic structure. We're not really inventing new molecules. We're just, we're just rehashing the old ones. Uh, but however, this was, it was pretty successful in terms of bringing uh, drugs that actually worked uh, to the marketplace uh, uh, other than phenobarbital. Now, from 61 to 78, there was a big slowdown. Um, in anti-seizure drug discovery in the U.S. Um, and there were some exceptions of carbamazepine, diazepam, and valproate, but carbamazepine and valproate 
uh, were brought in from Europe. We didn't we didn't do anything very effectively in those years. And uh, when I was a resident, you can't imagine how long ago, um, in the early 1970s, I didn't technically have carbamazepine available to me uh, for for treatment of epilepsy. I was limited to the first four drugs on this list, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Okay. So in order to do something about this, the NINDS, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at NIH, um, under the direction of Kiffin Penry uh, and with the assistance of Harvey Kufferberg and Ewart Swinyard, uh, in the mid-70s started what was called the ASP, the Anticonvulsant Screening Program. Its name has changed. Government can never leave anything alone. So now it's called the Epilepsy Therapy Screening Program. And, and, and perhaps that's better. Anticonvulsant is not exactly the right word. Uh, but it didn't matter. Uh, there's a contract to University of Utah to screen compounds, and they have screened more than 32,000 compounds, and they take them from anyone. Um, it's a tremendous program. And this is their latest revision of their screening, at least the one I'm aware of, 2017, um, at the University of Utah, uh, an incredibly long-running contract, by the way. Uh, and you can see that they're, how to identify the drugs is a box on the left, um, and then if it passes through that, then it gets into more uh, difficult uh, and, and challenging uh, uh, differentiation. Um, and this is good because we're trying to find drugs that aren't just like the old drugs, uh, and that's not easy. Uh, and one of the criticisms of the ETSB is it does tend to find drugs that are like the old drugs. Um, it's, it's an issue, uh, but it's been incredibly effective in bringing new drugs to the market. Um, does it find new drugs? Um, it has identified uh, compounds with 18 different mechanisms of action in the past three and a half decades and revolutionized drug therapy. Patients are treated very differently today than in 1975. So here we have the discovery of anesthesia drugs, serendipity screening and rational development. That's the kind of the old approach. Um, and the new strategies are potentiating inhibition, reducing excitation, modifying ion channels, and modifying presynaptic synaptic mechanisms. Screening, however, continues to be uh, pretty effective uh, because we have really good models. We have really good models uh, that we can use uh, to find new drugs. Now, a lot has happened since 1990, and you can see the list of things that have happened, including three drugs, where, albeit limited, indications, three drugs that were approved in 2018. Those three were not found by screening, but a lot of these others were found by screening. Um, and and uh, the list, I hope, will go on as we try to do something for people with epilepsy. You might ask about the mechanism of action um, and whether the mechanism of action is known or unknown prior to the onset of clinical studies. Um, with phenobarbital, uh, and phenytoin and ethosuximide, we really didn't know about the mechanism of action of these drugs when they were marketed. Ethosuximide, for example, works on uh, uh, T-type ca calcium channels, okay? Um, and we didn't know that until the group at Stanford discovered it, uh, which is long after it was marketed. Um, drugs in which the mechanism was known prior to the onset of clinical studies, let me get my little arrow down here if I can drag it down, uh, does not want to drag. All right, we'll forget it. Um, you know, my friend's going to drag it for me. There we go. Uh, drugs in which the MOA was known prior to the onset are, are some of their these are designer drugs, but they're not really great drugs. I mean, parampinol is probably the best of the group, um, and, and, and they've, they've, they've failed in part because of side effects. Um, and then we still have drugs that are still poorly understood after many years of study. Imagine we have Valparate on the market for decades and decades, and we still don't exactly know how that drug works. Uh, right? Next slide. Now, I'm not going to talk, as I'm going to move out of the discussion of how we find drugs and how we move it into how we develop drugs, okay? And there are certain things that I'm not going to be discussing here. Um, I'm not going to be discussing safety studies uh, or drug supply and formulation or drug metabolism or certain regulatory processes except for the IND, Investigational New Drug, and NDA, New Drug Application, uh, which are U.S. terms. Europe has similar terms uh, for their process, um, but um, I'm, there are certain things that I just won't have time, uh, uh, time to cover here. And now we're moving into the, the studies in humans. Now, in order to get a study in humans going, you need permission from the FDA. 
And the way you get this permission is with an IND, Investigation of New Drug. And how do you do that? Well, you take the results of all your preclinical work, everything you've done, the chemical structure, the mechanism of action, if it's known, but it's not critical. Again, the FDA doesn't really care uh, that much. And, 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 and they probably don't trust the investigators anyhow. So fortunately, it's, it's not that important. What, what's important is whether it works and it's safe. So you know, have to know the adverse effects in animal studies, and those are multi-million dollar studies, okay? That's a very expensive process. How the compound would be manufactured. Uh, you have to have safe environment, uh, good manufacturing practices, GMP, okay? And when you submit your IND, you have to have your clinical plan, how you're going to go about it, and your very first protocol, okay? So that's how you move into the clinic, okay? Now, here we're going to here we go clinical development of anti seizure drugs. So, what kind of profile would we like in in a new drug? We, we'd like a drug that works in patients that aren't responding. That's pretty obvious. We obviously we want middle, minimal adverse effects. Once daily dosing would be wonderful because compliance is a big issue with patient dependency. Uh, we don't want it to interact with other drugs uh, if we can avoid it. Um, we, titration is, is, a, is an issue that can be a, a bugaboo for new drugs. Um, and if it takes a long time to get the drug titrated, that's an issue. And a logical mechanism of action, I put a big question mark on that because actually that is not entirely important for this process. Now, I love this quote from the 19th century, there's scarcely a substance in the world capable of passing through the gullet of man that has not at one time or another enjoyed the reputation of being anti-epileptic or anti-seizure, if I may stick it in there. Siva King's uh, quote is just super. And to, to emphasize that, let me show you, I'm going to jump ahead, then I'm going to come back to phase one. But this is a clinical study of the lennox gastaut syndrome, Okay. Uh, this is a terrible group of patients. Um, they, they have all sorts of awful things going on besides their seizures. Um, uh, they have uh, mental and behavioral issues, um, et cetera. So, and we don't have really good drugs uh, for the lennox gusto syndrome, even though there have been some recent approvals. But here's a real clinical trial from the 1980s, which actually – I insisted that the company do this because I was chief of the epilepsy branch. Uh, they were doing uh, uncontrolled trials, and they found that this drug was really gangbusters. So they did a controlled clinical trial, okay? And you can see um, here, if I drag my arrow down, uh, that 69% improved. Well, um, if your child has lennox gastaut syndrome, you want to run to the nearest pharmacy because almost 70% of the patients improved in this controlled clinical trial. Howsoever. Let's look at the next one. Here's the placebo treatment, 63% improved. Aha, just shows that you can't trust the issue of bias control uh, in studies that aren't highly controlled. Even in epilepsy where you would think you could count the seizures and everybody would be objective and there wouldn't be a problem. Um, but this study, I think, is one of the best examples of how we have to control bias uh, in our studies. And the open label trials uh, are useful for safety, but often, often not useful for telling us whether a drug works. So let's jump into the product flow. We've talked about lead finding and, and what, what I might call IND track. Uh, we're leading up to phase one, which we're going to talk about next. Phase two, then phase three, and then registration. The IND comes in here, okay, to get into humans, and the NDA is the, the submission that you make so that you can register your drug um, and put it on the market. So let's go to phase one, okay? Now, it's the first two, three studies in humans. Uh, phase one is sometimes incorrectly used to describe the clinical pharmacology studies, which are performed throughout the entire period of the drug's development. Um, let me say that I ran Clin Farm at Wyeth, um, uh, sometimes we were doing as many as one study a week. You can imagine that. Um, and so we would, uh, we, if we had got out to an NDA, we may have 20 or 30 studies um, that I don't have time to describe here from ClinFarm. But phase one is the first two or three of these, which we also did. And I'm having a little trouble getting my arrow. There you go. So there are two fundamentals in clinical pharmacology that you need to start, start with. 
Uh, one is pharmacodynamics, okay? what the drug does to the body. And that's going to be both toxicity and efficacy. So that's what the drug does. This is what you want. Okay? You want efficacy. Okay? But we also need to know pharmacokinetics, uh, what the body does to the drug. And we measure blood levels to get all that information, which I'm going to detail a little bit as we go on. So the aims of a phase one study in the pharmacodynamic dynamic area is to get tolerability and toxicity and as much as possible the desired action of the drug, which we might call efficacy. Whereas pharmacokinetics, we want information to correlate with both toxicity and the desired action of the drug. We want to see if we can relate uh, those, those blood levels and the half-lives and the quality of the distribution, et cetera. And this is in small molecules, typically done with small numbers of volunteers. Uh, in, in certain disorders like cancer, the, the drugs may be too toxic to give in volunteers. But in general, the small molecules we're looking at um, in epilepsy, it's done in-house with volunteers. Okay? So we're looking at toxicity evaluations to include duration, intensity, degree of reversibility. Um, um, we, all of this is a function of dose and duration of dosing. Again, we've talked about normal volunteers, and we all, almost always want to get to the maximum tolerated dose. And I'm going to go into that in some extensive detail uh, because I think it's one of the things that we really forget. Um, so if we can ev evaluate the efficacy in phase one, that is wonderful. And, and there are drugs that this can be done. When I was running Clint Farm, uh, we sometimes had a drug that we could actually get a response that would be predictive of the therapeutic effect get my arrow down here, um, and, and if possible, this information would be readily, readily accessible. Unfortunately, this almost never happens in epilepsy. We've got to get to phase two. We have to get to patients. There's just no way so far that we've learned how to figure out how to get phase one efficacy data out of normal volunteers. No surprise. Okay, but the PK profile we can certainly get. We can get a lot of information from from. From, uh, from normal volunteers in this case, we can about absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination, um, whether there's linearity, et cetera. Um, and so we get a ton of information about uh, the pharmacokinetic profile. Um, and and, and that's going to be very important on, on how you dose the drug, whether you dose the drug with food, how often you have to dose the drug, et cetera. So this is the, these are the pharmacokinetic aims of phase one. Uh, so anyhow, what we're, what we're trying to shoot for in phase one is selection of doses, okay, and a safety monitoring strategy and dosing in relation to meals. Now, when we get the, when we get the phase one data, um, we want to then move to proof of principle, okay? Does the drug work in human disease? Under what circumstances does the drug work? Uh, can we get an early assessment on on whether we're going to be able to get enough good data to move to a phase 2B, for example, and, and especially phase 3? Um, and proof of principle in seizure disorders continues to be difficult and expensive. I'm going to show you a particular design called the Sesteo design. Uh, get my arrow down here. The, this is from uh, Rajiv Sesteo that we did with, 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 with Tigabin. Um, and uh, it's really neat, uh, but it's hard to do, and it's very labor-intensive, and it's expensive, um, uh, and it, it may have other problems. There are also small MTD placebo control studies. Um, uh, I'm not a big enthusiast of this because I think that looking uh, for efficacy uh, in small uh, population, populations of patients is fraught with uh, being underpowered. Then there's PPR screening, and I'll have a whole slide on that. Um, I think it's massively overused, but in any case, um, this is a this big this is a big issue uh, of where to go after you think you've got phase one done and now you want to move on. So, no shortcut uh, shut, cut, cut, shortcut has been found that's been really reliable uh, for preliminary efficacy, and the really only way is to do a randomized blind, blind control clinical trial. Um, that's my view. Uh, there are others who may not share that view. Let's take a second to talk about the photosensitivity test, a uh, so-called PPR uh, test, uh, developed in Holland. 
it uses photosensitive patients to test new drugs. So if you have a photosensitive patient, one who, one who uh, when you put them on the EEG machine and flicker the light at them, uh, they get a PPR, they get a response. Uh, if you use a single dose of a compound, you may decrease this photosensitivity. I think this is a valuable surrogate for photosensitive epilepsies. However, I think it's misused as a surrogate for partial seizures. Um, it makes the assumption that all epilepsies are the same. Photosensitivity is extraordinarily rare in partial seizures. Carbamazepine, a terrific drug for partial seizures, doesn't work in this model. But companies are desperate for a surrogate. We've talked about that already. It is a big problem. So what happens if the study is negative? Does that mean you jump the drug? Uh, well, uh, that's, a, that's a big issue. And I put my reference down there if you want to know more about my bias on this issue. So let's now talk about clinical trial considerations in epilepsy. We need, we need preclinical predictions. We need to know about the patients, concomitant medications, doses, and study designs. And we'll take those one at a time. Let's talk about the preclinical factors. Efficacy in animal models. Well, if it's effective in maximum electroshock, that's a good sign, for example, that we might want to study this in partial seizures. We need to know, is this drug bioavailable? Does it get into the bloodstream? Uh, if you have a bioavailability of 5%, you don't have a drug um, because, for, for example, uh, variability will be horrendous. Um, so you need to know all the PK issues, and you need to know something about the safety profile, which you presumably got a little bit of data from if you went to the MTD um, uh, in, in phase one. And you need to know about drug interactions. That's, a, that's an, an, an interesting issue, which we'll come back to a little bit later, later on. Um, so let's talk. Uh, we've talked about the preclinical predictions. Let's talk about the patients and seizure type, okay? We have a slide on that. The first important concept is that many different syndromes are included in the epilepsies, uh, and meaningful data cannot be collected from an undifferentiated group of patients with epilepsy. It, it's the, this is not a disease. This is a syndrome, um, and we, we have to remember that. So the type of seizure in general determines the choice of medication in the clinic. And this is used to segregate patients for clinical trials. Now, this is not entirely correct anymore. Um, you might say, for example, that if you're studying the lennox gastaut syndrome um, or Dravet syndrome, you're really studying the syndrome. Um, however, they usually make an effort to measure the effect on one seizure type in that syndrome. Um, but in any case, it's the type of seizure is, is fundamental, in, in certainly in partial seizures. Now, let's talk about the two kinds of seizures, in case you uh, uh, haven't been exposed to this. Many of you probably have. Two kinds of seizures in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell. The new term is focal, not partial. Uh, so you see I, I revised my slides to reflect the new classification. Um, I won't tell you why I think that's wrong, but that's, a, that's not important now. Uh, these begin in a localized part of the brain. They don't always been, begin in a pinpoint part of the brain. As a matter of fact, you can do a hemispherectomy for partial uh, for focal seizures and call it a localized part of the brain. But anyhow, there are focal aware, simple partial seizures, focal unaware, and focal seizures. By the way, patients may not be aware that they have lost consciousness, so I don't I particularly like that term um, because it suggests that the patient themselves is aware of whether or not they had a partial seizure and had, and had alteration of responsiveness. Then there are gene generalized seizures which begin without evidence of a localized onset. You notice I carefully worded that. We don't know if there's a localized onset for these, um, and uh, we, this is not my job to go into this in any detail. Uh, but we, we do part partition our drugs in part by these things. Now, let's talk about partial or focal seizures, okay? The, 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 the advantages of, of studying this particular seizure type uh, is the attacks are relatively easily recorded. The patients are relatively common, especially uncontrolled patients, um, uh, and it correlates with animal models, um, maximum electroshock um, and kindling. So that's really good, okay? Uh, there are some disadvantages. There's a within-group heterogeneity. Some seizures may be short and difficult to quantify, um, but if you used uh, monitoring, for example, you can, you can avoid that. And a low seizure frequency may require a long trial. These patients may have only three or four seizures uh, a month. Um, but this is, this, this is the big uh, kahuna in epilepsy. This is where the money is for, uh, for finding uh, new drugs uh, because partial seizures uh, are the big problem uh, in adults. 
let's talk about seizure frequency for a second. Um, you have to have a patients with uh, relatively high seizure frequency uh, to have a measurable effect. If the seizure frequency is low, okay, the, best, the investigator has to compensate with either one of two things. You've got to have a larger number of patients or a longer period of observation, which, all of which makes everything more expensive. So if you have a high seizure frequency, that helps. You can't study, for example, new patients uh, that are, had their first seizure uh, very often because they, they may not have another seizure for a year or two years or ever. Um, so you have to start with patients where you know you can actually measure the process. Let's talk about concomitant medications and drug interactions. Um, the drug interactions, in my opinion, must be defined before performing a definitive clinical trial. Um, for example, if you have a new drug A that you study in the clinic uh, and you haven't really bothered to do drug interaction studies, um, uh, and you find that drug A drives up carbamazepine levels um, in your study of partial seizures, then the FDA is going to say, oh, right, you have a very nice drug. It drives up the levels uh, of a very effective drug, we know, carbamazepine. Um, maybe you should do it in a study without carbamazepine, uh, or maybe you should just take out the patients that were on carbamazepine in your study. What, what, either of those is a disaster. Uh, obviously. So you just, you, you've got to have this under control uh, before you move off to a clinical trial. Okay? Let's talk about the doses to be tested. Um, this often gets inadequate attention. Not all doses are effective. And the best plan when possible, in, when I'm talking in patients now, I, I also, also emphasize this in phase one, is to include the MTD, the maximum tolerated dose. Okay? So why do we do this? Now, this is my opinion. Um, it's not necessarily uh, shared by everyone, um, but I have two slides on why I think we need to do this. We need to know the dose-limiting adverse effects in humans. What happens at the MTD? Is this toxicity, and you're going to get toxicity, that's why you're pushing it to the MTD. Is it safe or is it dangerous? Now, I've divided things that I think are good signs, aha, good signs, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, attacks, headache, Maybe drowsiness. I'm not into sedative anti-seizure drugs, but drowsiness is, is, is not terrible. Um, these things tell you, doctor, I've had enough. Back down. They're dose-related, um, and we'll just back down the dose, and we'll get rid of these things. However, there are some bad things that can happen um, as you go up to the MGD. Uh, QT interval prolongation, for example, or liver function abnormalities. Those are signs that maybe you really don't have drugs. Uh, and you really need to back out early uh, so you don't waste a lot of money uh, if you have a drug that's going to give you these kinds of life-threatening problems. And remember, the clinical practice, a few doctors will always expose that those are the effects anyhow. This effort should begin in phase one, as I've discussed, but the patients, the MTD in patients is, in fact, much more reliable. So let's go to my second slide, which this is on safety. Now we're going to go to efficacy. Okay, and here are reasons why you should go to the MTD for efficacy. You need to test at least one dose in clinical trials near the MTD to assure you're not overly optimistic about the drug's efficacy. A big error is to limit phase one or phase two through the coverage in animal studies. Now, it's easy for me to say that, but in, in, in Wyeth, I actually was willing to go above animal studies very carefully, uh, in, certainly in phase one, uh, to, to get to the MTD. Another big error is to assume that the efficacious doser in animals will correctly predict the required exposure in humans. Don't believe it, okay? Don't believe it. And certainly don't believe uh, that the basic scientist that says all you need to affect your target is a certain blood level, uh, and you don't have to go any higher than that. Uh, big mistake, okay? So if you conduct a control clinical trial with no adverse effects at any tested dose, okay, you didn't get to MTD, you run the substantial risk of having no efficacy at any dose, okay, a, a waste of millions of dollars because that means that you did a study at too low a dose, okay. Finally, don't re beat up on the regulatory agencies from to trying to stop you from get, getting the MTD data. They may not know it, but they need this information as, as much as you do. Okay, finally, things, let's talk about study designs, and I'm going to use ritigabine. Okay, I developed ritigabine while I was at Wyeth um, from phase one through the end of phase two B. 
Um, it's a potassium channel opener. It's, 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 it has a unique mechanism of action. Uh, we weren't absolutely sure about that when we in, in licensed it, but we learned about that while we were in the middle of the evaluation. Now, I mentioned earlier on that, that, that I was going to talk about the so-called Sachdeo study, okay? And there's the reference. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to go into this in too much detail, um, but what you do, you start with a standard anti-epileptic drug over here, okay? Uh, and then you start retigapine, and you do stepwise titration upwards, okay? So you get to the MTD. Remember, I want to get to the MTD, okay? But while we're doing that, we learn about the effect of retigabine um, on the standard anti-epileptic glove. We, we learn about the interaction uh, in this process over here. Then we over here, we take down the retigabine, and we learn the effect of the standard drug on retigabine. So it gets both sides, um, and you do this with four, we did this with four drugs. Um, and uh, it was em enormously helpful uh, in establishing what kind of dose we might use. It's, it is, in fact, we did 60 patients at three sites. Uh, again, the such data reference. Um, it may be difficult to perform today. Uh, there's some, maybe some ethical issues about taking patients off their standard drug, et cetera. Uh, but it was very effective at the time. Um, but it's been a while. Now, so we did this. And what did we learn? Well, we learned that it, it, the safety was okay. The doses ranged between 14 and 1600, but we thought 1200 was pretty close to the MTD for most patients. We learned something that I was, unfortunately, we had to bite the bullet on, and that is the half-life is so short. We take it being we had to, we had to dose a TID, which is a big burden um, and was always a big burden for the drug. Uh, and we never got a sustained release, by the way. As much as I tried to do it, um, there are minimal drug interactions for the four drugs tested, um, and so that's good. Um, and there was a little e efficacy, but uh, it remains to be demonstrated in controlled clinical trials. I don't believe in the, this is an open label study, as I've mentioned, um, and I don't believe in open label data telling us about whether the drug really works. However, we then went to phase two B. Okay. So this is, the, this is the real big job of taking the data from the Sachdeo study and putting it into a bunch of patients, uh, 399 to be exact, um, and doing a randomized double-blind study, okay? We did partial onset seizures, one or two anti-epileptic drugs, greater than four partial onsets or equal to four seizures a month. Remember, you have to have enough something to count. Uh, no 30-day seizure-free period. Three doses of retigabine, which we have derived from the Sachdeo study, 6, 9, and 1,200, okay? When we have two outcomes, one FDA and one EMEA. I'll come back to that in a little while because um, I have a slide on that. Okay, so here's the design, and it's a parallel dose design, okay? And you start uh, over here uh, with retigabine, and you gradually increase it, and some people stop at 600, some people stop at 900, some stop at 1,200. You, if, if you can't tolerate it, you get a little bit of relief down, for example, to 1,000 if you're up here, but you can't go to 900. If you catch 900, you have to fall out. Um, and I'll show you that the titration was actually an issue with this drug, even though we tried pretty hard uh, to do a good titration. Okay, so there we have, and of course, we have a placebo arm uh, down at the bottom. So that's the design of, uh, of the studies. Now, our current design's optimal. I'm just going to take a pause here, uh, and, and this slide is from my good friend, Jackie French. Um, and I think she's, she's on target with some of the challenges that we have with current trial designs. Um, we have both recruitment issues and, 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 and other issues. When you're trying to recruit a patient, they have multiple new alternative therapies. Now that we have all these drugs since 1990, why would they want to go into a clinical trial? And in fact, what they, trying a new marketed drug is relatively easy, um, but studies require more clinic visits, and, and you may go on a placebo. Uh, so that doesn't uh, encourage people to get any clinical trials. It makes it more difficult. Um, and site selection, because you have to find more sites to find more patients, you end up with general neurologists with large practices and maybe sites without specific epilepsy expertise. And you may admit patients that don't belong in the clinical trials. They may be, not have epilepsy, may be misclassified. So thanks to Jackie, uh, Dr. Jacqueline French, uh, for this slide, because it, it really highlights one of the real issues we have in developing seizures. 
Um, if that weren't, were not bad enough, um, Rivlin did a study in SUDEP. And they say, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. I'm just going to say that the problem is that if you're in the placebo group, you're more likely to have SUDEP. Okay? Well, that's bad for the placebo people. It does mean that we're, we seem to be testing drugs that are efficacious because if they weren't efficacious, there wouldn't be a difference in SUDEP. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it, it puts a, 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 a bit of a pall over our ability uh, to do placebo-controlled trials, although we still do it. Uh, back to our study 205 now. With a six-month duration, two months maintenance, I told you, excuse me, we had 399 patients. Uh, we had patients enter the long-term extension. By the way, you always have long-term extensions of your, of, your, of your clinical trials because you need long-term safety data. Okay, you may have to have it with epilepsy 12, 1,500 patients with partial seizures who've been on the drug for a while. Uh, so this helps you, uh, this helps you, this long-term extension uh, helps you when you're trying to uh, uh, make your NDA uh, down when you're getting ready to register your drug. Okay, so how did we do uh, in our 399 patient uh, study? Well, both 900 and the 1,200 separated from placebo, and there was a dose response curve. Hey, hey. That's beautiful, okay? So uh, that was wonderful in partial seizure frequency. Uh, the responder rate uh, wasn't quite as dramatic, but we did separate 900 and 1,200. Um, we had adverse events, but remember what I said. I, I like these kind of adverse events, okay? Somnolence, confusion, dizziness, tremor, amnesia, thinking abnormal, vertigo. Uh, none of these are life-threatening, and they're all kind of dose-related, and uh, you, you, you can back down the dose. Uh, and get rid of the problem. And uh, that's what we do in clinical practice. Um, the, the problem was with this particular drug, I won't spend any time on this, is that most of the people dropped out t during titration. Uh, this drug has to be titrated very slowly, um, and uh, it, it, it's not, from that standpoint, it's not a great drug. Um, however, our conclusions weren't bad, okay? We had therapy significantly reduced the seizure frequency. We had a linear dose response two effective doses, adverse, adverse effects were CNS related, that's good. Discontinuity were more frequent during the titration phase. Um, and we didn't have any really bad things uh, happen, which is, which is really good, at least not at this stage. Later on, some bad things happen with this drug, but not at this stage, okay? Uh, this is the open label study. Um, I'll just skip by that because I don't, I'm, I'm running a little short on time. So phase three. Phase three is uh, where you take the successful phase two program and you get big data from lots of patients, okay? Um, and you, you want to, if you, for your FDA submission, you're looking at re median reduction in total, total partial seizure frequency, whereas in uh, EMA submission, it's a proportion of responders. Uh, uh, but th th they tend to track each other, so it's not a big deal. Uh, so here's the phase three studies for retigabine. Um, 1,200 milligrams a day versus placebo, and retigamine 6 to 900 a day versus placebo. One was in Europe, the Martin Brody study, and Jackie French did the study in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and they got great data, but what happened? They discovered blue lips and blue fingers and blue retinas. Ah, they're a terrible problem. Uh, and it turns out that the FDA says that this does not indicate visual loss or, or anything more than a cosmetic effect, but that was enough to kill the drug. The drug, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, uh, stopped all their studies immediately uh, and eventually pulled the drug from the market, <laughs> which is why I have no conflict of interest. The drug is gone. So in summary, slide number one, in spite of the large number of new anti-seizure drugs introduced since 1990, we still have many unmet needs. Many patients continue to have adverse effects from their medications. Refractory seizures are still an issue in 20 to 30 percent of these patients. Um, and uh, we, have, we, we still have a lot, as I say, a lot of work to do. Um, even worse, uh, this challenge is, is a big challenge for the industry. Um, the expense and complexity of this process is daunting. Uh, the return on the outlay is certainly not guaranteed, uh, especially in CNS. And industry currently sees CNS in general as a difficult area for investment. And I'm going to show you a slide um, from uh, Dennis Choi, uh, 
um, which was generated in 2014. I guess that's now five years ago. Um, and you can see that these are the CNS programs in large pharma uh, from 2009 to 2014, and they're all dropping. I mean, Novartis is maybe one exception, and uh, I'm not sure they're now an exception. Uh, but you can see that all of the big companies are getting out of CNS. It's too tough. Uh, the, Alzheimer's is too, is, is too tough. Stroke's too tough. Even epilepsy is too tough. So the, the, it, it's, it's not a good sign for those of us who are trying to do something. Sorry, I, I hit the wrong button. Okay. Um, but anyhow, this is a big issue for those of us who are interested in new things for, C, for CNS disease. One thing I want to point out is um, there are those who say we've made no gains, that all the drugs we've developed haven't really improved seizure control. But this is a really nice study by Ed Fought, uh, uh, 2015. Uh, on average, patients taking more than one or one first-generation experienced epilepsy-related hospitalizations 684 days, while those taking greater than one second-generation AEDs were hospitalized every 1,000 days. And this was highly statistically significant, and it suggests that the second-generation AEDs uh, reduce epilepsy-related hospital encounters. I see this as a small bit of what I call incremental gain. I mean, that's the term that I'm using over here, incremental gains. I mean, we've made, for example, in breast cancer, we've made incremental gains. Breast cancer is now not the fear disease it used to be, and I think we're also making, albeit smaller, incremental gains with all our new seizure, anti-seizure drugs that we continue to develop and continue to appear on the market. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about something called extrapolation. Um, uh, this is a concept of taking adult data and making it uh, accessible uh, to, uh, to children. And the PEACE group addressed assumptions that if you had a similar disease and similar exposure response, that after two years, the underpinnings of focal on onset seizure, is children are similar to adults with, with focal onset seizures. So this is what the PEACE group decided. Um, and I can get to the next slide. Um, the FDA included that they'll go down to four years. Efficacy can be extrapolated. That means you don't have to. That if you don't, well, we'll come to that. Determination of similarity in pediatric patients and adults, similar exposure response in, 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 in children to adults. And what does this mean? It means that efficacy trials will not be needed, okay? Um, you have to have a, a PK analysis that shows that the dosing regimen gives you a set of similar drug exposure uh, and down to four years, not to two. Uh, but it, and you have to do a long-term open label safety study. But... Um, and, and efficacy trials are still needed for children younger than four, but it's a huge, that's a huge windfall for pediatrics um, and, and really good for the companies too, uh, who, who aren't faced with doing very expensive efficacy trials. I want to point out that this was also extended um, from uh, adjunctive trials to monotherapy setting. I, I haven't got enough slides to emphasize this enough, but uh, we used to have to do a, a clinical trial to prove that a drug worked in monotherapy. No longer. We can use our adjunctive trials to, or to, to achieve monotherapy. There's a great review of this, um, all this whole process there. Uh, okay, so this is our summary. We finally got through phase three. We got the drug registered. Um, too bad reticabine uh, made all those blue things, uh, or it still would be on the market with an extended release. It might be a great drug, uh, but uh, that happens. So that's the story for drugs. Okay, now we're going to switch gears. Um, we're going to talk about devices for persons with epilepsy as part of my assignment. Um, whoops, it says 2018. Ha-ha, it's 2019. Well, well so, so slip through uh, all of my reviewers, including me. Um, and we're going to go and talk about devices uh, in epilepsy. So um, these are regulated by the FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Uh, although I are always changing the name of the place, so I hope I'm still right. Um, but the real bottom line, and it, the, the takeaway here is the next line, which is, and I'm going to get my little arrow down here, uh, re medical devices are divided into class one, two, and three, okay? Um, and the, as you increase from one to three, the regulatory control increases, okay? 
Now, all devices must be registered. You just have to send in a form. Everything, okay? You just have to register, okay? Um, and the requirements vary tremendously with the class, and we'll get into that. Not all devices require notification. That means you can market your drug without telling the FDA if you're in the right class, okay? So let's go through these classes, okay, and, and give some examples, okay? So this is class one devices. Am I green? Here we go. Um, FDA has exempted almost all class one devices from pre-market notification. You can market these without telling the FDA you're going to do it. You have to register, send in a form saying you're going to do it. But once you get ready to market, you can just go out there and do it. You still have to comply with GMP rules. What's GMP? I mentioned it before. Good manufacturing practices, okay? If you're going to market tongue depressors, um, you can't have a factory that has rats running around on the floor of the, uh, 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 of the manufacturing uh, plant, okay? So you have, to apply, you have to have a certain limited ability to make sure that you don't put out tongue depressors uh, that are coated with some terrible bacterium. Okay, that's what we call good manufacturing practices. Uh, but here's some examples, the thermometers, blood pressure cuffs, dental floss. These are good examples uh, where you, you can just uh, register it and send it in and you're off to the races. Okay, well, now class two is much more complicated, okay, and, and has, is loaded with exceptions. Okay? This requires a pre-market notification, okay, although some are exempt. And it must demonstrate that the device is a sense substantially equivalent to one legal predicate in the commercial distribution in the U.S. In other words, it's the same kind of thing already marketed, okay? Although, an exception, you can have a de novo 510K, okay? You can't remarket the device without authorization from the FDA, unless you're exempt, of course. <laughs> so, so it's a basically you have to negotiate with the FDA. You again must have your GMP. Here's some examples: transcutaneous magnetic stimulation, wheelchairs, and condoms. I thought those are good good examples uh, of class two devices. So now let's go to class three, and here things are really tougher because you're going to uh, you're going to have to do a pre-market approval a PMA, which is roughly analogous to the NDA, okay? Uh, these are high-risk devices that propose, propose a significant risk, okay? Um, you cannot market the device without FDA authorization. In other words, you have to have your PMA approved, uh, just like you have your NDA approved. And the PMA process is complicated and similar to drug development, okay? Clinical data must be submitted to the FDA to support the claims for your device, okay? Carrying on with that phase three stuff um, is uh, they, you, you have to have an investigational device exemption for class three. That, that means that you're going to do some clinical studies before, and you must get approval from the FDA. So an IDE is roughly analogous to an IND for drugs. Before you go into humans, you have to have an IDE. Now, interesting thing about, uh, about devices, you need one randomized controlled clinical trial, unlike drugs, where you almost always have to have two. Okay, but devices, you only need one, at least at the moment. Um, the approval of the PMA, it's just like an NDA, uh, for labeling, post-marketing requirements, uh, and GMP approval. Now, some examples of these um, are Neuropace RNS system, DBS for Parkinson's disease, and recently approved for epilepsy, replacement heart valves. Okay, so these are examples of, of, of uh, devices that have been approved uh, by the FDA through the class three process. Now, this is just a, a kind of a sideline. Uh, cleared medical devices are ones that the FDA has determined to be substantially equivalent, okay? So I'm actually doing a little backtrack. Um, I, I'm going to skip this slide because I, don't, I think it's out of line, okay? Whereas approved devices are those that which a PMA has gone through, okay? So uh, what I'm trying to say is um, this is so-called cleared uh, and, and this is approved. And, and the difference is, is mostly in that approved requires a PMA. Um, now, <laughs> I worked for the federal government for 20 years, and I thought that this, uh, this paragraph, um, which I have time to read, uh, which is outrageous, but it, it tells you how complicated the government can be in telling you that you can extrapolate from adults to children with devices. For purposes of this docu document, extrapolation refers to the leveraging process whereby an indication for use of a device in the new pediatric population could be supported by existing clinical data. I'm not going to read all that, okay? 
Uh, it's funny, but anyhow. But the bottom line is down here, okay? The bottom line is, get my green arrow here, devices approved for adults can apply for extrapolation to children, certainly as young as four years and possibly down to two years. That's great, okay? Um, and it requires trust in the adult data that the adult data are similar to what is expected to occur in pediatric patients, just like all the rest of the, of the uh, of pediatric extrapolations for drugs. It's the same kind of concept. Okay, but this is again good for kids, um, and it's good for the drug company. So that's that's a plus. So let's go on. And these are the devices um, that have been approved um, uh, in the U.S. Uh, for epilepsy, and that's the VNS and the RNS and the DBS. Okay, so how are they doing with extrapolation to have for children? The VNS has done great. It success, successfully extrapolated to age four. The RNS is planning it, okay? And again, I know that because I was the chair of their data monitoring committee until recently. Uh, and I have a conflict of interest there, uh, which I would like to point out again. Um, uh, DBS, well, they're still trying to get their, uh, their whole overall act together for epilepsy, and maybe later I got from a senior consultant. Um, but they probably will do it too. So that's the end of my lecture. Um, I have re references and sources of more information on two separate pages. Um, it, it's page two. Um, and finally, I would like to say thank you for listening. If you find an error or a, cor a correction, I'd like to hear about it. This is my email address, rjporter.md at gmail.com. Um, there are 108 slides. That's possible. I even made mistake uh, in 2009. So 2019 uh, it is. Um, that's the end of the lecture. Thank you very much.